We've all seen them, even if we pretend we don't. The people hanging around downtown parks, the ragged folks mumbling to themselves or yelling at unseen demons, the wanderers with all their possessions on their backs. But the face of homelessness is not just about these people. It is about families, youth, working people. It is about the chronic homeless and those in temporary need. It is about any one of us who could, given the right circumstances, also find ourselves homeless. I don't have an actual idea how big it is. I know there's a lot of them. I don't, I hope not a lot because I don't see a lot. From where I'm from, there's more here than um, where I grew up, but that's, that's the only thing I could really tell you numbers wise. I really don't know the, the number itself, but I'm pretty sure at least in the couple of hundreds. I couldn't come up with anything that approached a number. I know it's much larger than we probably believe it is. I don't know, between 100 and 200? Maybe 750, 750 people. They are male, female. We have families that are homeless. We have some youth, uh, folks who are under 18, um, who are homeless. I think the majority of people that we probably have, if you had to say what particular um, demographic is, is mostly male. Um, but that, that encompasses all ages, all races. Sometimes, you know, there's loss of jobs, sometimes there's mental um, problems that arise. There's, I mean, there's different circumstances for everybody. We probably have uh, lost um, their house or whatever. So others may have just fallen on the hard times. You know. A lot of them do work pretty hard and aren't able to support a home, you know, or a family, you know. but they can never get enough, you know, then you're hungry when you get off, you've got your $40 that you made that day, and you stop and buy something to eat, and no money ever accumulates so that you can get yourself a place to live. I was forced to leave my home because of a domestic dispute with my boyfriend. And right now I have no place to go, and I'm pregnant. And it's hard because there's not no room for, for a lot of women that are out here. Donna Summerall was once an advocate for the homeless. Now at age 46, suffering from diabetes and heart problems, she lives on the street until her church can help her find an apartment. Income I get, which is a SSI check, is five, $579 a month, and if you know how rent is, that's not enough to pay rent, utilities, food, that's not enough to survive. Janelle is a college graduate who fell on hard times because of health and money problems. She hopes for retraining to get back to work, but for now she spends her days at the downtown community plaza. That all of us homeless people are not bums. We're not a terrible people. We're trying to survive. Jerry was awarded two Purple Hearts for his wounds under fire in Vietnam. He's been homeless for 21 years, nine of those in Gainesville. He and his friend Brenda, a former registered nurse, survive on meals from social agencies or by scrounging in dumpsters. Well, once in a while you may see me walk up the street right here, I'm picking up cigarette butts. That's so we can have something to smoke. I was getting disability. Somehow, where my mail used to go at was shut off. The guy had been throwing my mail away in the dumpster. I lost my disability on account of that. Wasn't much. But it got us by. Getting by, a day-to-day -day existence of looking for food and a safe place to sleep. With only around 300 shelter beds in Alachua County, that means hundreds of people may be spending their nights in parks, in cars, on porches, in cemeteries, and in tents. County Commissioner Rodney Long spent two days living as a homeless person, an experience he describes as humbling. I had no idea that we had a homeless population of people who were disabled. We have five people who live in the downtown area every night in wheelchairs. 
I had no idea that we have people on crutches and canes. This is my world. But it's stuff that I give to other people too. I mean like the medicine and the condiments. They share everything they have. I mean, they provide. They give their last to each other. They, they provide for each other. And when you go into the homeless community, it's like a community. It really is. You have tents, you have people, some people in the, in the, in the commune chop the wood, some do this. It is just, it's remarkable how they live. Like third world countries right here in America. And, and, and for people who are driving down some of our major arteries, if they only knew that this was a homeless community here, they would do more. This is the face of homelessness that so many people think of. The trash, the panhandling, the petty crime. Transients drawn here by services like the VA Medical Center and Alachua County's proximity to I-75. Clean up all of the clubs. That's right. I've been doing that for about nine years. But the woods are also full of people who, for whatever reason, have chosen to live there rather than seeking other shelter. I couldn't pay the rent because I wasn't getting that much on Social Security. Never. And no, so she, uh, no. No, not the no, I had to leave, and that's when I became homeless. It's about two years now. I've got a good watchdog. She might be only eight months old, but I guarantee she lets me know anybody that comes up. While some complain that the police are too forceful, too overbearing in their dealing with homeless people, others say they do a good job. The police themselves admit they walk a fine line between having to enforce laws like trespassing and helping the homeless get the services that might help them. We know a lot of homeless people by first names, um, but it takes that relationship building just like anything. We have to build rapport, build respect, and build trust. It's very difficult for us to bring in a lot of services because we're not service oriented to that fashion, but we try and partnership with a lot of different organizations who do provide those services, and we also help to get those folks into those organizations. Our research has indicated that it's probably about, say, 150 kids, mm -hmm. approximately, mm -hmm. that are out there somewhere. Children can become homeless for any number of reasons. They may be with a homeless mother. Others, on their own and homeless, may have been in foster care, legal trouble, or living with relatives who asked them to leave. They put a backpack on and walk around and you really can't tell who they sure. are. Some of them might be living in some of the camps in the woods. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just going, you know, couch to couch. Mm -hmm. Or there were some apartments here we discovered, you know, when we were going to court, that these kids would go into these apartments and really be taken advantage of. They'd get involved in sex and drugs, and then their lives were never the same. While service agencies like the Preserve and St. Francis House help different groups of homeless, the overall support system has been described as fragmented. There are a lot of overlapping, very committed volunteers who work kind of hand in hand with each other. There's always going to be shortages where you have a particular person who may be in need of a lot of services and be unwilling to get those services. So that puts us in conflict with um, that person. It may put homeless advocates or people who are looking out for that person's well-being in conflict with them. But the, the vast majority of people who need services can access some. There's just not enough. You, you see where I'm going with this, right? Men at the Salvation Army participate in a life skills class as part of their attempt to move away from homelessness. I'm 22 years old. I'm originally from, from Kansas. <laughs> uh, I got down here uh, as homeless uh, for two days. I found a job. I was getting paid $10 an hour. I worked that job for six months, uh, started doing coke. Uh, next thing I know, I don't. My lease is up, and I have no more money. <laughs> uh, so I end up here. Uh, I lost my job about the same time, and my motivation. And, you know, it took me a while to get it back, but now I work two jobs: one full-time and a part-time job. And I won't ever fall again. Rocky is one of the lucky ones, getting the help and support he needs to get back on his feet. But homeless advocates say services like these are scarce and much more needs to be done to give all homeless people an opportunity if they want it. If somebody is provided with transitional housing, what are you going to transfer them into after you get the housing? Because they need long-term care, they need uh, help with job skills, communication skills, and just generally 
resocialization. Mm -hmm. So the housing alone is not going to transfer somebody off the street right. back to a productive job. People are homeless because we don't have a living wage, we don't have affordable housing, and we don't have access to health care. I have found over the years they've become my teachers. They've taught me more about love and compassion and patience and courage than any other experiences in my life. And I would ask everybody out there to examine the level of affluence in your life. I mean, how much money you have that you're just blowing on, you know, fancy restaurants or designer clothing. The solution to this problem is to get, get a shelter where the people can get the help that they need, where they can move on instead of just turning them right back out on the street, which solves no problem. But shelters and services are not always easy to provide if communities feel that something should be done as long as it's not in their neighborhood. We have a huge not in my backyard syndrome, huge. And I mean, even the Walmart thing, which isn't even housing, is an example of not in my backyard. It's everything's okay as long as it's not here. We've had uh, situations in on this property where um, we did not trespass the homeless. We, we really didn't go out and solicit them, but we allowed them to sleep on the porch. This neighborhood has gone berserk. But where some see only selfish residents, others like developer Ken McGurn argue that the issue is not that simple. As part of a study on solutions to homelessness, he argued that shelters should be spread out. For instance, allowing churches to take in up to 10 people at any time. The problem is zoning. Anytime you say homeless, shelter, the neighborhood's going to come out against it. And our position is, if you put everybody in one place, they stand out, and they don't mix in the community, and they stay separated from the community. You want to integrate them back into the community, and you do that through small numbers. You do that through a maximum of 10 beds in one area. It's a long-standing and complex problem. The desire to help those who need it the resistance of communities, the questions about the kinds of services that should be delivered, and the economic realities of business. One of the problems with any downtown or any city is they put one shelter in one place and it ruins everything around it. Money, community resources, community resistance, the role of governments, the role of nonprofits, all just small parts of a very complex puzzle. I really feel as if the existing providers are doing a fantastic job. We just need to figure out how to get more resources to them and to, and to really look at where the gaps in the whole system, um, where those gaps are, and figure out how to fill those in the most effective way. This 10-year plan is not the destination. It's the roadmap to get us to the destination. And so I really Finding ways to fill the gaps is just one of the goals of a summit charged with developing a 10-year plan to alleviate homelessness. Santa Fe Community College President Dr. Jackson Sasser sits on the summit steering committee and thinks that this institution could be a catalyst for many educational and outreach services. I have never been in a community that has more goodwill than this community. If we identify a problem, then we, we set about solving it. You know, we should honor that, that people choose to lead that life. This, this is not a better than, but those that don't choose, I think our opportunity as a college is to transform uh, where they are into a life and, and the pleasures that you and I and others enjoy in this community. I don't really feel like we truly are the fifth meanest city, but um, you know, I, I feel as if there has been some value that's come out of that ranking. I think it has led to some self-examination and to some people saying, you know, this is an embarrassment and how do we really try to be serious about trying to get this problem solved? Yes, Gainesville is going to cost us something. Yeah, it's going to cost us a little money, a little time, a little effort to try to get people educated, motivated, and moving in the right direction. Because if we don't, if we don't, we'll continue to build jails. We'll continue to have people sleep all in that park. You know, uh, everybody's just one paycheck away I mean, from being in the situation we're in. Uh, not all of us are here by our own choices. Uh, some of us uh, will try. I mean, we, we don't want to be where we're at any more than you want us to be there. I mean, just give us a chance. You know, I guess the, 
that's all, that's all we can ask for. The Alachua County and Gainesville City Commissions have committed to moving ahead with the 10-year plan, starting with a review to see which of the dozens of proposals can be implemented right away. It's clear that comprehensive community solutions like those recommended in the plan can begin to enhance the services now in place. But because of the complexity of the issues surrounding poverty and homelessness, solutions won't be easy or cheap. It's doubtful the problem will ever truly be eradicated. But with political will, private sector and community support, perhaps we can ensure that the people who want to be off the street can be and that fewer will end up there in the first place.